Live from Nassau in the Bahamas, it's theCUBE, covering Polygon 18. Brought to you by Polymath. Hey, welcome back everyone, we're here live with theCUBE's exclusive coverage of Polygon 18. We're in the Bahamas, I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, co-founders and co-hosts of theCUBE. We're here with special guest, Halsey Minor, entrepreneur, Serious serial entrepreneur here on theCUBE. Halsey, great to have you. You're the founder and CEO of VideoCoin, successful ICO. You had an event last night, kind of a investor thank you event uh, out on the, in the Bahamas Country Club there. You're here. Man, you're a pro. You're back in the game with this crypto. This is a wave. I mean, I want to get your perspective because you see waves. You've seen CNET. You started that from scratch before online news was anything. You were the pioneer in that. Uh, first investor, first operator in at salesforce.com, a variety of other successful entrepreneurial ventures. You got a nose for the waves. So just put it in perspective. Yeah. What is this so, wave? Yeah, so, uh, so I actually have an interesting story because I've actually started around 2012 um, and I launched my first business in, in 2013. So, so the first problem that I saw was, how do you get your money from your bank account and buy, and buy Bitcoin? Still a problem, it hasn't been fixed, right? So, so I tried to fix that, I did, I, to a certain extent fix the problem. So what I, what I did was um, created effectively a Coinbase competitor and I started out and was going to make it very easy for you to, you know, to take your bank account, connect it up, it seemed logical, and, and then buy you know, cryptocurrency. The company was, was called BitReserve at the time. So no bank would touch anybody named Bit in their name, and it was even worse than that. All of us who put our company name into our bank account, we had, we had our bank accounts. Uh, basically shut down, right? So, so I started getting an idea how difficult this was going to be. You know, Coinbase getting a Silicon Valley Bank account early on to become the conduit was very fortuitous. It ultimately took two and a half years in buying a big chunk of New Jersey Bank before we were able to allow you to connect your U.S. bank and your or European bank into Uphold to buy a currency. So it's really Uphold, Coinbase, maybe like GetBit, very, very few who have been able to like crack that problem. We literally had to buy part of the bank to do it. Um, so that's where I started. So I really looked at it very much as money, as a new monetary system. Um, and, and I still see unlimited opportunities in that area. It wasn't until really a couple years later that I saw the blockchain as a new ar architecture for computing. And what I mean by that is what Bitcoin proved was that if you gave people software, and they ran it on their computer, and they got paid in some funny kind of digital money. They would convert that money back into fiat, or, you know, dollars, and they go buy more computers. And nobody asked anybody to, to, to be a Bitcoin miner. They just kind of showed up. The more the bigger it got, the bigger opportunity. And what's most interesting is whether you make money or lose money depends on your cost of power. So if for most of these, these Bitcoin miners, then you're hydroelectric uh, dam. So what I realized, and VideoCoin is in the area of video. It's a direct competitor with Amazon Web Services, everything we do in video. So there's an, it's called encoding, which is you compress it, there's storage, and there's streaming. Three, three basic pieces. And what I realized was we can, two things. First of all, 20% of the servers and data centers are not used at all. They're called zombies, right? So all of these people in kind of an Airbnb, Uber model, they can all of a sudden start earning on assets that are doing nothing. Right? But even if you look at it into the future, if video mining, which is what we call it, ends up being like Bitcoin mining, then what happens is that, is that the whole thing works on the cost of power. It's not good for Amazon if they have to be competitive solely based on the cost of power. Dave, so he's got an ICO going on. Um, we looked at Filecoin, right? So Filecoin was storage, um, and that's infrastructure. You go to Videocoin, we're streaming right now, we got video. This is kind of like an interesting digital media infrastructure. Well, what's your take? Compare the thing that's interesting to, file to me coin. that I'd love to get Halsey's input on, because you, you've you got the full spectrum here. You started in, in publishing, yeah. and, and now with, you- With five TV shows. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, CNN had five TV shows. And, and so, right, and, and so very digital from the beginning, yeah. Yeah. and relatively ripe for disruption, yeah. and in, now into banking, which really hasn't been disrupted, no. but we all, think it's coming. That's right. So that's an in interesting spectrum. It's not Negra Ponte, I don't think, Bits versus Adams, because you've seen, you know, taxis get disrupted. Yep. That's, 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 that's right. Adams. That's right. So you know, what, what are the factors that, that make an industry ripe for disruption? 
Um, well, I mean, the obvious thing is really disruptive technologies, right? And so, so for the internet, for me, it was, uh, I, I started the company in 93 to be on commercial online service like AOL. And I saw, I guess, the first browser in 93, and that's actually at Sun, and it made me believe that this internet was gonna be this incredible thing. And it was really seeing information coming in, mm -hmm. you know, and the internet wasn't that big back then, but I watched mm -hmm. like a, a, a GIF of a storm, you know, and uh, from one of the, the weather centers. And so I realized that this, this information thing was incredibly interesting. And so what all of us did, the way I thought about it at CNET, is we're cracking open databases and we're just letting people have the information. And it was silly things like the ability for me to live in San Francisco, but know what the weather was in New York and pack appropriately. This was kind of the magic. I mean, we take all of this for granted. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so this was magic <laughs> right at the time. Like, oh my God. You had to go out and buy a check USA stock today. Price. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Call your friends in New York. Yeah, so that was magic. So at a very high level, it was just access to information. If, at a very high level, what this is, is combining information and money into a packet, right? So, so now what we can do is I can gather information from servers about what they're really doing and I can also be paying them at the same time. So, you know, it would have actually solved a lot of problems around the internet, because yeah. in the internet, getting paid was hard. And there were so many times we'd go into a meeting and we'd, we'd agree on the partnership, but we didn't know who was paying who. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, am I paying you for traffic? Or are you paying me for content? Or, you know, how is it? So, so this kind of comes with a built-in payment system, um, which is, I think, what makes it so incredible as a system. So and we're more stable, I would, I'm inferring, long, long term anyway, because that whole, that system you just described in the internet kind of all blew up when the funding dried up. It blew, it blew up, and I think, um, you know, I think there are certainly a lot of risks. I mean, the number one thing I would tell everybody in this area is, you know, be very cautious about what you invest in. Um, there were a lot of companies that, um, so, so my whole description was sort of of the internet bubble was that, you know, people say, well, you know, nine trillion dollars was lost in investing. And but everything I, happened though. And, and Press.com happened, and, and, everything happened. And, and what I said to the people is it would be great if people had just invested in the, the survivors, but who knew what they were? Yeah. Yeah. The only reason the United States emerged with, you know, with you know, Salesforce and, and eBay and, and uh, um, you know, Amazon, uh, Amazon and et cetera, um, the only reason that, that we emerged dominating the world was because we invested in them all. Right, yeah. it's and, so, <laughs> but, and so, but even, so even all those things that were called silly ideas actually happened, and they ended up happening. <laughs> right. It was all a matter of timing. Yeah, all of yeah. Them. yeah. All so, so you know what's happening now is is very much the same thing. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people are going to invest in a lot of bad ideas, right? Yeah. And but this is all necessary for the good ideas to get funding and for something big to come out. So I get your take on with the video coin and, how, and compare because you mentioned Amazon, right? So our observation, obviously, we're reporting. Uh, all these shows, Amazon Web Services, among others, um, the big guys are sucking all the oxygen out of the room. Look at the, look at just look at the, look at uh, the big whales, right? Google, Facebook, yeah. Amazon. I mean, we're, we we can't even run any ads on our site. We actually prefer to just push the content That's all right. over the world because it's hard to build a destination site. I mean, people going Very out hard. of business in the media business, mm -hmm. video. Your choices are Ustream now owned by IBM. Uh, Twitch TV became Amazon, which yeah. was Ustream before that. Build your own custom player, set up a CDN, yep. which is actually hard and expensive. Yep. Okay, so do I use Facebook Live? Again, controlled by Facebook. That's right. So there is an opportunity that yeah. you're pursuing. Did you have that in mind? I mean, we see it every day, and we know this, and luckily we have a, a good deal with Ustream, but the point is that's going to be up too. Yeah. What's so, the alternative producers, content producers who are streaming, whether it's a pro set like this or you know, someone who's going to have unlimited access to video streaming? So the real issues, the two are cost and innovation, okay? And so, uh, so Hanna Abbasi, who's the CTO of 20th Century Fox and one of our advisors, right? So all these media companies, they have the same problem. Nobody is watching broadcast anymore, the cost of nothing, mm -hmm. and everybody's now streaming it, which is one-to-one -one and has a cost associated with it. Mm -hmm. So that's why, and, and, even, and even worse, video is going to 4K, 8K, VR, you know, the data is going up like this. Yeah. So and bandwidth isn't growing as fast either. So all these companies are confronted with all these costs and they can't monetize it. Google can monetize it, uh, Amazon can, mo can monetize Telcos. it. Telcos. Netflix, can <laughs> yeah. Ouch. But they, but they can't monetize it. Yeah. So it's all cost effectively and, and, and no revenue. Mm. So, so the one thing that we offer video coin by using all these resources, so we cut the cost 60 to 80%. 60 to 80%. So that, that, that's huge. The other thing is, 
in the early days, everybody bought um, Salesforce because it was cheaper, it's one tenth the cost. And I used to say to people, you know, in the long run, it's going to be way more innovation, right? Because they're constantly, every quarter, rolling out a new version, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to have this, the ability to connect an API effectively, mm -hmm. the ability to connect, and a whole ecosystem can, you know, can arise around that, and, and that's why their conference has 140,000 people, Dream, Dreamforce, because there's a whole ecosystem. Yeah, that and lives. it's sticky as hell, too. That's Hard right. to get out. That's right. So, so, so while we are 60 to 80% lower cost, we're also effectively open source at the same time. So the ability to have a community arise and develop software. And so right now, you've seen this huge consolidation because it's actually kind of hard to build new kinds of apps on top of Amazon Web Services, right? But if you have this open system and you have all these people who are contributing code to it, all of a sudden, you, there are apps, video apps, that you, they'll, they'll be literally So are you going to have an open source contribution piece to your? Yeah, I mean, basically everything we build is open source, right? So, yeah. so you know, all the way through the network. So, so it creates a, a, a palette for people to start in, uh, in, uh, innovating in video because really what's happening is a lot of the innovation is getting hurt by the fact that these big guys totally dominate it. Right, and they, they don't want to see any innovation outside of the ones that they bring to you, right? <laughs> right, so you've heard my rap on this. I'd love to get Halsey's you know, thoughts. So the big guys, so you're right, have won. It's like centralization, victory. Yeah, and then that's right. People here say, no, we want to, we want to take it back. Uh, the, the premise that I hear a lot is, there's been no innovation in protocols. And, and you know, Google built Gmail on SMTP, HTTP, DNS, I and mean, it's all government funded. Yep. Or academia. Yep. And it was just been a lack of innovation. That's right. And now, this is why I counter Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger is, oh, we're building out a new set of infrastructure. That's right. Okay, so where do you guys fit into that? What are your thoughts, first of all, on that, that premise? And, and where do you guys fit? Yeah, I mean, look, you've got these huge companies that are totally dominant. And even though they are, in fact, in, you know, innovative Silicon Valley companies by label, okay, they have all the same issues. Like, like I say to people, Nobody today believes that anybody can put Amazon Web Services at risk. If I went to somebody and said, you know Amazon Web Services, which is worth three quarters of the value of the company, or five, six, depending on who you talk to, there's going to be something after that. It would literally be a new concept, because everybody's convinced, and this is, the, this is Amazon's, yeah, this is their big, this is the way they make all their money. Oh, this it's is, over. Uh, right, <laughs> and, and if you said to somebody, there is going to be a next thing, they, they would look at you like like you're you know yeah. like like you're 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 foolish, but the reality is, when you start changing some basic underlying infrastructure in the internet, and you start doing thing and decentralization, this is the word we're going to be yeah. using, yeah. you know, it's we're going to see it in solar power. I mean, solar power is on a yeah. you know an, on, on a you know a cost to benefit like this, yeah. so you know it isn't be long before we're going to have our you know powering our house legitimately, not yeah. like yeah. you know some science fiction thing. We'll be legitimately powering yeah. most of our needs with solar that we connect because the cost is coming down so much. So we're going to see all of this yeah. decentralization happening. And, and in the world of computing, decentralization means that this is going to be the most efficient that computing can ever be. Because it's just compare using the Uber and Airbnb model of saying anything that's excess, let's turn in to, you know, let's turn into value. And yeah. I've heard that for every Uber driver, 15 cars go away, right? So, and that's, so this decentralization is going to have a profound yeah. effect on the economy, and it's going to have a profound effect on these big yeah. guys. Oh, and even those yeah. guys are going to get disrupted. They're, they're going to get disrupted. disrupted. And, and so, but, but they're 20 years old. So. It's time for them to get disrupted. <laughs> I mean, you know. It's, well, <laughs> e e-commerce is a 20, 30 year old stack, some say, some say 20, 20 year old stack on e-commerce. Um, all these things are ready. Even what we would consider modern, you know, the miracle of saying, oh, weather in New York. I mean, that magic is here now in a new way. So I got to ask you the I question. Take it for granted. I got to ask you the question because you brought up that point. In your, in your history of your career as an entrepreneur, because you are doing stuff that's always new and cool, uh, and probably before anyone else sees it, can you talk about some of the ideas that you've seen, not necessarily your ideas as well, others, where the investors said, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. So what billion dollar opportunities have you seen emerge that investors have said, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard? Well, actually, the, the one that, that is, is Salesforce. No VC would put money in. Uh, it was really kind of backed by Larry Ellison and me early on. And, and, and what, so. Google so, was so, a dumb idea. We so, didn't want portals, so the, not yeah, search. So the, so the bet that nobody would take in 2000 was that companies would take their sales information and they would put it in the cloud. Nobody would believe that. No, not anyone in, and so, and I used to joke, and I used to say the only way it's going to happen 
is if the sales guy who's been waiting two years to get his you know, sales management system in place actually runs over the head of security in the parking lot. <laughs> that, that's what it's going to take. Because it's outsourcing. Yeah. And you know, the security guys would say, oh, no, 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 we're going to lose all of our data, yeah. right? It didn't matter that Salesforce had way more security guys you know, than, than these guys had, and, and better, you know, working internally. Nobody believed in it. Literally nobody believed in it. But this is, your point about, this is your point about the decentralization. No one's going to believe, wait a minute, that could no. never happen. So in, in a way, the investor thesis should be, I want to invest in the dumbest ideas, because that it might is. be the best it idea. Is. <laughs> it is, I mean, the big obvious ones that attract billions and billions of dollars, I mean, how many of those end up actually not turning into anything? Right, a lot of them, right? I mean, so, so yeah. CNET was profitable $9 million. Um, I believe that Yahoo was profitable on $3 million. I think Google was somewhere around 12 to $15 million, right? So there are a lot of these businesses, Amazon's kind of obviously the it's outlier. still not profitable. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. the outlier. But you know, a lot of these businesses are started by people who use a relatively small amount of money and are very creative. You know, and you kind of yeah. hear this over and over again. Microsoft did, never yeah. needed any money. They, they accepted $5 million from... Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. yeah. So this happens a lot, and, um, um, and, and in fact, I think it's very dangerous when in year five you're losing $300 million, right? I mean, you, you 500, yeah. whatever it is, you know, you, there are a lot of things that can, that can kind of, that can go wrong. Um, What's the role of community? Because we heard the guy from Lock Tower Capital say something I thought was pretty profound. I don't need VC because um, if you're a startup, you can actually, don't have to waste your energy on board meetings and other things. You can build your business and use the community as your benchmark. So yeah. this plays to your whole picking up the slack kind of thing and efficiency. So yeah. entrepreneurs can be more efficient in these communities. This is where the crypto uh, currency blockchain is thriving. What's your thoughts to that? And, and how do you see that community interaction progressing? I, I, I mean, I've been, you know, in my career, there's been a sea change in sort of the culture of of technology and really everything, right? Which is, you know, when I started out, everything was very hierarchical. You know, it's like how far up the chain you got that measured how successful you are. Now it's how big is your network, right? And, you know, I, I, was, I was talking to somebody the other day who said, you know, these VCs are going in and they're measuring these companies' success by how many Instagram and Twitter accounts they have. And there's massive fraud going on because people are buying these yeah. accounts to yeah. pump up their numbers, right? Yeah. So and people followers. are starting to value by the breadth yeah. Yeah. of your network. Reputable network. Reputable, yeah. Not fake network. Yeah. But what I heard is there's actually a Twitter application that I haven't seen that'll go in and tell yeah. how many of them are real mm -hmm. and how many of them are, are, are not now. Um, so really this the, the community becomes, you know, almost the measuring stick for your value. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so it hasn't, you know, before at CNET I had users. You know, today everybody has community members. Yeah. And so, so it becomes sort of kind of like everything, I guess. Yeah, and that's our media model is all community based, which is we just naturally go there because that's where the, the data is. That's, that's where right. The, that's where the, that, the feedback is. That's right. I mean, I can't get feedback from Facebook and Google. They don't have any, they own the data. Right? They own the data. There's no letters to the editor on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> There's only hate you know, comments. But you know, before Microsoft and all these other came, you know, IBM dominated the world and nobody ever yeah. thought they would go away. You know, yeah. AT&T dominated the world and nobody ever thought they would go away, you know? All right, and, personal question for you. I've got yeah. to wrap, because I know you got to go. Appreciate your time, by the way. Great, great story, you can go off for another hour. Personal note, what is the most compelling thing that's moved you as, a, as an entrepreneur in the crypto market? Like something that, uh, it could be an anecdote, it could be a situation. When you look at this opportunity, as the world's going to eventually be re-instrumented with data, with new open source and community, what's, what's something that surprised you or moves you as an entrepreneur saying, this is freaking awesome? So, so this hasn't been done yet, but, but it will be done. And so this is what actually motivated me to start Uphold, um, was the ability to turn your phone into your bank and to be able to exchange money and um, primarily really solving the ability for the poor to be able to move money around without having 10 to 20 to 30 percent of it taken away. Everybody's talked about this, remittance. And, and so far, nobody has actually solved that problem. That problem is going to get solved. I mean, it's inevitable that the phone becomes the bank. There are so many regulations that are designed to stop that. And it's extraordinary. You have, once you get in it, you see all the ways see, that have been set up. System. So this, this system. This problem should have been solved long ago, right? Yeah. And every phone should be a bank. I mean, it, it could be connected to a bank, but every phone should have my money in and I should be able to send it to you instantaneously. And it shouldn't be like getting into Fort Knox. Yes, yeah. I mean, computers, <laughs> banks have computers. They could make this happen today. They just, they just don't want to. So I think the most profound thing for me 
is the problem that's still not solved, the problem that I set out to solve, which is really creating a more equitable financial system. And we live in a country where the banks make about $37 billion a year in bounce check fees. Think about that, $37 billion in bounce check fees. So if you just take that out, you just take out, because it all, it all affects, yeah. it, it all affects yeah. people on the lower socioeconomic yeah. scale. This you, is what you, you, cre you create a revolution, just getting rid of, of the, uh, the, the, the bank fees that people pay for bouncing checks. Well, I mean, the narratives, like the narrative of, of taking down gatekeepers or central authorities is the premise of this ecosystem. That's and right. you could take that, that example and apply it to thousands of use cases. And yeah. banks are rapacious, <laughs> flat out. Yeah. American banks are the most rapacious because yeah. no other country would allow $37 billion to be taken away and bounce check fees. Halsey, congratulations uh, on your success again, and great to see you on theCUBE. And you're now a CUBE alumni, so uh, great. Yeah, congratulations, you'll get, congratulations yeah, thank you guys. on that too. Yeah, We're going to really. get you in our Telegram group, so now you'll be 42 members, we just turned on last night. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate your time, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, thank, you very, and, pleasure. And, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for your insight and uh, experience and commentary. Halsey Meyer, experienced entrepreneur, pro, um, here in the trenches, establishing a great new venture. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break. Stop.